Hello and good morning everyone and thank you for joining our webinar today focusing on securing the cloud with Prisma Cloud by Palo Alto Networks. So I'm delighted to be joined by John Wood, Cybersecurity Systems Engineer at Palo Alto and we, all have, uh, we also have Mark Simmons um, on the call. He is our Security Specialist here at Bytes. Um, so just before I pass over to John, I was going to go through some housekeeping details with you all really quickly. Um, so you are muted throughout the webinar today, but we'll be holding a Q&A session at the end. So if you do have any questions, just pop them in the questions box just at the right hand side of your screen. I'm also recording the webinar today, so I'll send you all a link to recording this afternoon or tomorrow morning. And there is a really short feedback form at the end, so if you would like to request any further information um, or a callback, just pop that in there and we will be in touch. Okay, I'm now going to pass you over to John to run through the webinar with you all. Fantastic. Thank you ever so much, Amy. Um, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. It's a real pleasure um, to be able to speak to you today. Um, and thank you for your for making time um, for us to do so as well. Um, just to kind of remind you, there are the options to um, to ask questions. So if anything comes up, any, any kind of thing I'm talking about during the uh, the, the course of this session, um, and you, you may have some questions on, write them down in the in the kind of Q and A section of the of the app, and we will uh, cover them off at the end. Um, I wanted to spend a little bit of time with you this morning talking about um, the kind of intersection of cloud technologies and security. Um, we all know that cloud is a, a very broad topic. It means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, right? To a lot of you, the old meme um, probably still holds true that the cloud is simply someone else's computer. Um, some of you will, will, will maybe may well be embracing the cloud in a very significant way, maybe using things like SaaS applications as well as public cloud um, in, uh, infrastructure, um, maybe you're transforming your businesses, maybe you're kind of just starting off or considering moving off on that journey. Um, and one of the questions that always comes along in your minds when you're considering such a, a massive change as a business is how do we maintain our security stance? So I want to I want to take you through some of the ways in which security intersects with cloud technologies. First of all, how how it can how how we can use security to you know bring security into our cloud environments that we might be migrating to um, but also some of the ways in which cloud can assist us can help us um, have better security outcomes so a couple of questions that um, may uh, come to mind when we start talking about cloud security um, a few use cases that i'm going to cover off in today's session the first one being how can cloud help us provide security to our users? So this is covering really a, a trend that's been going on actually a lot longer than the cloud itself. 20 years ago, um, we would, most of us would be sitting in offices within bricks and mortar businesses, working with applications located on our internal networks. Um, now, of course, we're much more fluid and much more agile as a, as a workforce, right? To give you a, a, an example of this, um, this morning I'm presenting a webinar to you uh, from my office uh, at home. I'm a, I'm a field-based worker and I'm as likely to be in our office in London as I am visiting partners and customers, uh, working from coffee shops, airport lounges, as I'm sure many of you are as well. So we're no longer fixed as a workforce and neither are our applications and for that matter, our data. So the question becomes, how can we use the cloud to provide that traditional view of security, security of our users and of our data? How can we extend that in a cloud environment? The second question is, how can we secure our cloud-based infrastructure where you are embracing the cloud, moving workload into public cloud environments like you know, Amazon Web Services, Azure, even Google Cloud. Um, how can we um, extend security to, uh, to those devices and provide a consistent level of security? And to how, how can we um, ch challenge some of the secure, uh, unique security issues uh, that we will find in those types of scenarios? And then the final thing I want to answer is how can the cloud help us deliver better security? In other words, how can we take advantage of all this great processing power, agility, information to drive better security outcomes? And we'll be covering kind of use cases on each of these. So to start us off with the first question, 
as I've mentioned, business has transformed massively over the past 20 years. Um, this used to be the view when I started in this, this industry, um, we used to call it network security, right? It, it was securing a local area network and usually that involved um, a bricks and mortar office or perhaps there were a number of offices. Um, they all had their internal networks. They had data centers either on site or maybe just down the road at a kind of colo data center. Um, applications were running in there. All the data was stored within those um, uh, within those applications at, at within our bricks and mortar. So the job of network security in those days was to protect the inside from the outside. Well, such a massive amount has changed um, since then. The way that we work, and actually what we work on uh, as well, we're likely to have bring your own device policies, for example, um, where um, a device might not necessarily be um, something that's been built and owned by the IT team. We also have the problem of IoT devices. We have a lot of sensors going into our offices and our environments now that aren't necessarily traditional um, operating systems in the sense that, that we can uh, um, secure them with, with traditional technologies. Our in organizations have spread out. We, we are more likely to be setting up branch and retail locations and in greater numbers and a greater pace. And of course, our mobile workforce has grown dramatically in that time as well. And that's partly because of how the applications have transformed. Our applications are now more likely to be found either in private data centers, public cloud environments, or SaaS applications. You know, the number of people using something like Office 365 with the Exchange server in the cloud, or Google G Suite, for example, um, utilizing the cloud, it, it makes it just as easy for a mobile worker to access those applications in the cloud as it would an internal worker to access those applications as well. So that kind of divide has broken down. And the question becomes, how do we provide consistent security in that particular, in that, in that example? The reality is that up until now, the response of our IT teams, our, our security teams, has been to try to find point solutions to fill the gaps, to, to make up for um, the lack of security that, that, that you know, the, the kind of traditional security you would have at your um, your headquarter uh, perimeter. So you, we, we will find this real kind of smorgasbord, if you like, of different technologies, everything from VPNs to, from, from site to site, um, using MPLS networks to get branch locations to data centers, using uh, web-based, cloud-based proxy solutions to try and secure web traffic. And, and, and then there's the question of the mobile worker. A lot of circumstances, there's going to be an inconsistent security posture where different technologies are overlapping. They all work in a slightly different way. They all have coverage and um, they, they all have gaps. So you're likely to have avenues that aren't being secured as effectively. Um, and what we need in this particular scenario is a kind of consistent security posture. Imagine a scenario where actually the mobile worker gets the same security as the office worker in, in the HQ. And we know it's the same security. We can see that the same policy is being applied. And also we have logging coming into, to, into the same place. So these are some of the kind of the, 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 the customer problems, essentially, that we're trying to solve um, using um, cloud-based security solutions. The other problem in this scenario is that in a lot of cases, the traditional approaches don't necessarily scale in the same way that we we would have, they would have done in the past. So now that our applications are moving to public cloud and SaaS, the traditional approach, which of course is to get MPLS networks and to, to send all network traffic from the organization to a central data center where security is applied, doesn't necessarily make sense because you're effectively um, creating more traffic and, and you're slowing down business. You know, you imagine the, um, the branch office worker trying to access a, a, a a, a, an application in the cloud, his traffic is being sent all the way across to a private data center, security is being applied, and then that traffic is coming out of that data center and going right back out to the application in the cloud. So we need to be able to secure people uh, and effectively bring ourselves in line uh, with this uh, technology. Gartner recently um, published a report um, and coined a new phrase, and that, that phrase is SASE. Uh, or, or uh, secure access service edge. And this is the, the way that they envisage network security, as it traditionally was known, being applied in the, in the age of the cloud. And that's also something that 
we're providing with our technology. So problems that we have with the current approach, um, it's, it slows down business. In particular, you imagine branch offices where uh, MPLS networks are being deployed. Now, if anyone's ever tried to organize a, 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 or, or, or order an MPLS network, it actually takes a long time to do so. It's a slow process. Internet, on the other hand, ISP-based connections can be bidding very quickly. So leveraging traditional internet connections rather than those MPLS um, can be used. But of course, that then comes the issue of what about security and what about the, um, the, the reliability of that connection? You get an in inconsistent posture, um, as we mentioned. It costs a lot of money to have different point solutions protecting different parts of the organization. And it's complex, it requires training, it requires people to understand many different ways of working through different interfaces and different uh, policy structures. And the, the user experience is also poor because things will not be consistent from a security perspective. So our solution um, in Palo Alto Networks is a technology that we're calling Prisma Access. Prisma Access essentially is providing security as a service um, across the, the entire width of the organization. And the aim here is all about consistency. It's about providing consistent policy, consistent experience for the users, and also providing easier ways of bringing our, our rapidly developing organizations um, into our kind of security infrastructure. So there's some great use cases around, for example, an organization that performs mergers and acquisitions. Um, Prisma can be overlaid as a security technology very quickly in those circumstances. So we think of Prisma Access as a security technology, but actually it does two things. Yes, it has a security layer, um, and it provides different security technologies that allow us to um, provide best of breed security to all of our traffic as it's passing through our organization. But it also provides this connectivity layer as well. A connectivity not just from our users into the security solution, but also connectivity across the organization as well. So for example, if you are trying to onboard a, a mobile user into Prisma Access, um, you could use something like a, like an IPsec or SSL VPN. We have a, a technology called Global Protect that's a, a, a very tried and tested technology for providing that. However, if you're trying to bring your uh, branch offices or, or kind of pop-up retail locations, for example, you can use things like SD-WAN. So Palo Alto, Net, Palo Alto Networks has recently announced um, an SD-WAN technology that we're launching um, in the near future that will allow um, these branch offices to onboard into this technology essentially with, with zero touch provisioning. You know, drop a, um, a, a, a device in, in, onto the edge of a network and it will set itself up and the, the result is that there's very little um, a, a maintenance that will be needed on that device um, to, to bring that device in, bring that site into the network. And then of course on the H, HQ side you may have an existing firewall and that's absolutely fine as well because Prisma it's not just about cloud, it can be used almost in a hybrid approach with on-premise firewalls as well as cloud-based firewall as a service. So the, 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 the approach of getting traffic into that environment is very, is very straightforward. Um, also getting uh, what we can secure, whether it be regular internet traffic, you know, threat protection, uh, looking for, for, for malware, uh, malicious content and the like, protecting access to um, our SaaS applications or public cloud, um, and even our internal data centers. Prisma Access can al almost be used as a backbone to your organization with service connections that allow traffic to be routed within that solution directly into your private data center. So there's some excellent solutions that can be provided by Prisma Access um, for, this, for this use case. The second thing that I want to talk about today is um, how, to, how we can secure the cloud infrastructure itself. Um, it's simply um, the original kind of panacea of, of embracing public cloud um, was that public cloud was, was going to bring a, a solution where security was no longer going to be an issue. You know, you would build your infrastructure through the likes of Microsoft Azure or AWS um, and um, your, your security would be taken care of. We now know that that's simply not true. In fact, every cloud provider embraces this um, shared responsibility model when it comes to cloud um, computing. And that essentially means that the cloud provider will secure their environment, will secure their, their, their infrastructure, but you as a customer of theirs are still responsible for securing 
whatever sits on top, whether it be your own infrastructure, your platform, um, whether it be your applications, your servers, your, your workloads, you still have a responsibility of, to securing those infrastructure in exactly the same way as if it was a private data center and, and you owned everything in one place. So just because you're moving to public cloud doesn't mean you don't have to cons consider the old security problems. They still very much exist. So to, to think about how um, things are changing with the, uh, with, with the with, with, with the kind of revolution of public cloud, um, eight out of 10 applications today are cloud enabled. So it's absolutely kind of moving in that direction. We've also seen that new technologies are, are, are kind of flourishing that, that speed things up even faster. For example, uh, by 2020, so next year, one in two enterprises, one in two organizations will be using containers. So things like Kubernetes, for example, um, to provide a, a faster, more agile approach to development. And serverless in itself, serverless computing is also on the, on the rise. Um, serverless is kind of the ultimate expression of cloud, where literally you're running a function as a service in a cloud provider like AWS Lambda, for example. Um, and um, this is the kind of ultimate expression of, of, of cloud computing, essentially, um, where everything is being managed by the cloud provider. You are providing a, a, a function um, and that function is then driving the processing of your application. But things are becoming very different in how workloads are being developed, how development operations team, DevOps teams are, are working with the cloud. A couple of examples of that is this concept of CICD. It's a, an expression that some of you might, might know already. Um, continuous innovation, continuous deployment is a, an approach to um, rapidly building um, uh, microservices in the cloud. Uh, updating them um, very, very rapidly um, and deploying them out across containers, for example, um, allows us to build applications much faster and with much more pace. Security is obviously a significant part of this as well. And we have this concept of moving the security, um, what they call shift left, essentially. Traditional uh, applications, security would never even have been involved until the point at which an application goes live. And then you have your traditional security infrastructure protecting it. Well, in this world of um, agile development operations, security has an opportunity to go um, earlier in, in that development life cycle. So to actually become involved during the build process um, to, to, to you know, prevent uh, vulnerable code from being quickly developed and, and pushed out. In a lot of ways, this pace um, of development is a, is a headache for security, for security teams. And that, our, our findings show that um, many security organizations aren't even aware what the development operation teams are doing in, in the infrastructure, let alone getting control over it. So bringing you know, security into this, uh, into this process uh, is something that we've been developing for a while with a, a technology we acquired recently called Twistlock. Um, so there's lots of things that are changing very rapidly in the cloud. Palo Alto Networks has always taken the approach of trying to be one step ahead of these developments so that when you as an organization decide to embrace the next generation of development technologies, um, Palo Alto Networks is able to provide security uh, to, to kind of help you along with that journey. Cloud providers themselves um, do provide tools to help secure um, the workloads in their environment. Some circumstances, they can be relatively basic. Um, some circumstances, they can be perhaps a little bit more um, significant. Um, most organizations, however, leverage at least two or more cloud providers. That's some, some research that Gartner has done. So it's very typical that organizations don't necessarily put all of their eggs into one basket, but will actually develop technologies across things like AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud. And this is made particularly easy because the proliferation of containers means that actually it's very, very simple to lift an application out of one provider and move it into another app, uh, provider. And that, that can be done automatically in most circumstances as well. So the, the, the rate in which different organizations can, be, uh, can, 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 em, can embrace multiple uh, cloud providers um, is, is very, very significant. And of course, then you've, you've got the same problem that, that we talked about earlier, which is about you know, different security technologies, um, extra uh, uh, development, sorry, extra time required by the security organization to train staff how to, uh, how to manage security across these different cloud providers. 
So to secure the cloud, um, you really need to be protecting everything that you have, all the resources across all the cloud providers, um, across that life cycle. So from the original development and build through to the production. Um, and uh, Palo Alto Networks uh, uh, Prisma Cloud technology is designed to help you achieve that. One of the biggest challenges um, that has come about of, of, as, a, as, as part of this kind of uh, uh, revolution of public cloud is that there are simply more ways in which mistakes can be made and those mistakes can be made easier and easier. If there's anyone who's developed um, uh, uh, you know, uh, in-cloud environments like Azure, for example, you'll know just how easy it is um, to make a mistake, uh, maybe add a uh, a public IP address directly to a to a uh, to a, a workload or a server in the cloud. Um, it's very very easy to do, um, and the security implications of that could be absolutely massive. I mean, you imagine the equivalent in a in a kind of in the kind of data center world. You would literally have to get an extra network cable and plug it into a server to make that mistake. In public cloud, it's very very simple. Click the wrong button and and, and boom, a configuration error has left you vulnerable to to a uh, to a potential attack. So it's a different type of security that we have to consider with public cloud environments. But the benefits of the public cloud is that it, it opens us up with, through the use of APIs to make it much easier to identify these, uh, uh, these, the, the, these potential configuration errors. And that's one of the functions of Prisma Cloud. Um, it, it's able to identify essentially um, configuration errors um, circumstances where a, 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 you know, a, a particular workload has gone out of compliance um, and needs to be kind of corrected. So lots of different things that um, Prisma Cloud could do. The best way to, 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 to kind of help you understand um, how Prisma Cloud works is to really show you it. So I thought I'd kind of jump across and hopefully you, you can see my, uh, my screen here. I'm gonna quickly refresh, make sure I'm still logged into it. There we go. So this is Prisma Cloud. So the way Prisma Cloud works essentially is it attaches via APIs to ma the major cloud providers and it provides a uniform experience across those cloud providers as well. So if you are using multi-cloud, this is a very strong technology um, for, 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 for you in that circumstance. And you can see that in this circumstance, we have assets across, my, uh, across AWS, Azure, as well as Google Cloud. And you can actually get a, a kind of dashboard view of, a look at what these these applications are um, that exist in these locations. If I move over to the alert section, we can also see how um, misconfigurations can uh, be identified by Prisma Cloud. So you can see common um, issues that, are, that appear here. So some of these things will be essentially audit events. So um, disks that haven't been cor uh, correctly encrypted, for example. Um, some of them will be network anomalies. So Prisma Cloud has, uh, has visibility over network flows uh, within the public cloud. So um, we can see where um, port sweeps have been done, for example. Sometimes they may be um, particular user activities that have triggered al alerts. And sometimes they may, they may be configuration errors and a, a, a really, uh, Classic example that I talked about earlier is this concept of internet, internet exposed instances. So whereas your public cloud may have a, a gateway in and out of the organization controlled by load balancers and firewalls and the like, um, if someone has created an instance in the cloud and, and given it a direct public IP address, that's essentially a backdoor into, into, into your infrastructure. So going into this um, example, Prisma Cloud is showing us the different resources that have this particular issue. So we can see across different technologies, different uh, uh, env environments, we can see all of the workloads that have this particular issue. And if you give it access to, Prisma Cloud even has the ability to automatically remediate. Because it turns out these APIs used um, by um, public cloud, pro provided by public cloud, doesn't just allow us to read what's in those environments, it also allows us to manipulate, it allows us to write. And if we give it the ability to, Prisma would allow you to select um, resources and just one click remediate. And that will make the configuration change on, on, on the back end to remove the public IP address essentially. Um, if we wanted to investigate these further, we can go into a particular instance. 
we can look to understand um, the nature of some of these alerts. Um, we can look at the resource configuration as well. So this is actually, this is a, a looks like a, a, a Google um, Kubernetes uh, uh, environment here. Um, what we can also do is we can investigate. And the investigate will allow us to move into our kind of graphical um, user interface um, that will show us more clearly exactly what's going on. So a significant part of this is this what's called um, RQL, uh, it's a query language that's being used. Very simple once you understand how it works. Um, it's automatically created in this particular environment to highlight to us, to show us um, what exactly is going on. So uh, in this particular example, we can see that um, particular instance, um, we have public IPs from the internet um, and we can click on it to find out more information about what the types of traffic are that are uh, uh, that, are attacked, that, that, are, that are coming into that um, device. Um, but the key thing to bear in mind here is that this is traffic that's not traversing our um, kind of, you know, our, our intended gateway into the cloud environment. This is coming in through a back door. And if I wanted to see other circumstances where this is happening, I can just manipulate the query language. So remove the filter that's showing us just this one account update the result and Prisma Cloud is now going off to find other workloads that are running in the cloud that also have network traffic that's coming directly into those resources. And here we go. So we can now see um, different network traffic. These are all different uh, workloads across our cloud environments um, that have um, direct internet connectivity. And in fact, you can see one of them down here, which is the one that's kind of highlighted with this red line. This is actually where traffic is coming from a suspicious IP address. So Prisma Cloud in this case is using threat intelligence uh, to identify known bad locations so malicious IPs on the internet. In this circumstance, we can identify a device um, in our um, environment um, where uh, and you can see SSH traffic. So what appears to be going on there is that someone is trying to remote access from a known malicious location into our environment. So it allows you to quickly identify that these are that this uh, uh, this is taking place. So to summarise, then Prisma Cloud is a great um, way of giving you the visibility. It allows you to throw controls around these public cloud environments, and as the in integrations with some of the more recent technologies uh, in, in the form of Twistlock for container security and, and PureSec, um, a technology that provides um, serverless security. Um, we're really going to see the, um, the, 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 the opportunities within Prisma Cloud to, uh, um, to, to help secure your cloud workloads um, dramatically increase. So I want to take a, 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 a answer the third um, question, uh, now the third kind of statement, which is how we can use cloud to actually help improve our security outcomes. Because although the cloud throws up a lot of security challenges for us, um, cloud provides us with opportunities. It, cloud, it provides us with near unlimited processing power and data storage capabilities to really help us change the way security operates. So it's really helping to, to drive um, the future of security in ways that we wouldn't have expected. And I'll give you an example um, of how this has worked in the past. Um, a good few years ago now, security, um, you know, the cutting edge of security um, effectively revolved around these sandbox technologies. So sandboxing became a, a dramatic way in which security could be changed um, for the better. So sandboxing is obviously the process by which suspected malicious code is moved into a safe place to be detonated so that we can understand the intention of uh, potential malware uh, in more detail. Um, now, when sandbox technologies came, came along, there were effectively two trains of thought within the industry, one of which was that um, sandboxes should be on-premise hardware. Essentially, you build an, a sandbox environment in your, in your infrastructure directly. And the other train of thought was that sandbox should be provided from the cloud. So a sandbox, uh, one of the challenges of using on-premise sandboxes um, were the proliferation of hardware. What was found very quickly is that to be able to effectively scale sandbox environments, um, you had to buy a lot of hardware. It required a lot of processing work, 
um, and it didn't scale very effectively. Whereas the cloud solution didn't really have that same issue because scaling in the cloud is a much more um, effective way of working and, and it doesn't require so much upfront costs. Um, and the same um, analogy really can be applied to some of the modern day security technologies that we're providing as well. Some of the challenges around the kind of cyber security part of, of, our, of our IT departments, um, there's a lot of um, noise in security. I mean, if you, uh, some of you, some of your organisations, you may you may be running um, uh, SOCs, you may be running security operations centres, you may be employing security security analysts to help keep your infrastructure secure. Um, and one of the challenges that security analysts have is that there's just way too much noise. So all these different security technologies in the infrastructure are producing alerts. Some of those alerts may well be significant. Um, a lot of those alerts may be not significant at all. The problem is that for the security analyst is how to uh, effectively um, find the needles in the haystack, essentially. Um, so lots of different point products, lots of different technologies across the organization, collecting data, uh, you know, producing these, these log, this log data, the overwhelming security teams. So a security team might typically go out and buy a SIM um, to centralize that, that logging process. And that's great, that will help for sure, um, but it means that instead of producing thousands of log files across 10 different devices, you've still got thousands of logs in, in a single device. So it's still um, a challenge to, um, to identify what's really interesting, really significant. And the reality is that for security teams, it takes far too long to investigate threats. And it means that only a small proportion of threats can be investigated and the, the threats that are being investigated could potentially cause damage before they're ever discovered. And that's where um, our XDR technology comes into play. So Cortex XDR, um, this is a security um, detection and response technology. It actually provides us with a number of different um, technologies in one place. So we have an endpoint protection. And of course, this is what one of the things that Palo Alto Networks is known for, is providing um, the, the best in security prevention. However, we know that no matter how good we are at trying to prevent cyber security threats, we're always gonna find one or two that slip through the net. And that's an absolute reality. No, no cyber security vendor can protect 100% of the time to prevent cyber threats. So that's where other technologies like detection and response comes in. Now you're probably familiar with the term EDR, endpoint detection and response, and you're wondering what the difference is with XDR. Well, the, the, the best answer to that is EDR is, by its name, focused more on endpoint activities. Um, XDR, on the other hand, um, brings data in, not just from the endpoint, but also from the network and also the cloud as well. So it allows us to do things like network and uh, traffic analysis, behavioral analytics, for example, within this single technology. And how does it work? Well, it utilizes what for many people will already be existing infrastructure. You may already have firewalls on the network. You may already have firewall technologies, virtual firewalls in the cloud, or you may be utilizing technologies like Prisma Access that we talked about earlier. And all of these infrastructure, these network infrastructures are producing log data. They're, they're producing a huge amount of information, most of which is just being discarded. And then on top of that, you'll have an endpoint technology, for example, Palo Alto Networks Traps technology that's also capable of producing a huge amount of information, not just about security threats, but actually about everything else as well. So um, what's going on within the uh, uh, within file activities, what different processes are doing within that within that device. So the, 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 the key to X, understanding XDR is to know that all of this data when leveraged correctly and automatically using machine learning technologies, it can be awfully useful at helping us identify where anomalies are occurring within the network. So the, the, what XDR really is, it's an analytics engine that's taking massive amounts of data from not just the endpoint, but the network and the cloud as well, um, and correlating that data together to help I, uh, our security analysts identify um, incidents that are occurring within the network. And again, it's probably easier for me to kind of show you how this works directly. So here's my Cortex XDR uh, environment here. Um, we don't necessarily try and flood you with log data. Yes, there's a huge amount of data that's driving XDR, 
Um, but the purpose of XDR is to present you with the, data, with, with the data you need to know in a meaningful and actionable way. So these incidents, they actually represent multiple alerts, which in turn are driven by terabytes and terabytes of data, most of which is meaningless information that no one would, 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 would think relevant at all. But when correlated together and when, uh, when, when understood in the context of a threat, uh, may suddenly become useful. And I'll, I'll walk you through how this works. So here are some incidents that are occurring within this environment. I'm going to click on one of these incidents now. The incident screen itself is showing us all of the artifacts and assets in one place. So artifacts can be things like executables or processes. Some of them will be legitimate, of course, WinRAR, um, Opera, Command.exe, these are legitimate applications. Some of them might be malicious. Here's a file that our wildfire um, threat intelligence technology has identified as being malicious. Um, we can also see other indicators such as IP addresses, domain names and the like. And on the right hand side here, we can see machines that are affected by this. So there's two devices in this particular incident. One's called PC22, one's called PC24. And you can see that the users associated, there's a guy called Gandalf, and a guy called Frodo. So there's two users, two machines. We're correlating this incident across multiple devices. So that might indicate some kind of lateral spread for that perhaps. If I bring this part up from the bottom, we can see some of the alerts that have been kind of grouped together into this incident. Some of these alerts are specific malicious activities that have been identified and they've come from different places. So a traps alert, for example, has been identified by as malicious by our um, endpoint um, technology. And here is an example. This is a, a piece of malware that's been detected on an endpoint. Pan Next Gen Firewall, this is of course relating to our network firewall, our next gen firewall. So um, here is an alert um, that, that's been grouped together with um, between endpoint and network. And then we've got other alerts, for example, analytics, um, something that's you know, perhaps not quite right on the network or, or um, uh, an anomaly of some kind. And then we've got the what we call BIOPS or behavioral indicators of compromise. So these are things where, you know, um, some seemingly benign activity has been going on, which is interesting in, in respect to a threat. And we can analyze this. So if I click on analyze, this is showing us, uh, going to show us the causality um, view of this threat. Here it is. This, this is effectively, we can step through process by process how this threat has proliferated. So we can wind it, wind it back right the way to the beginning. The first thing we can see here was WinRAR. It may be that WinRAR came from something else. So if I click on show parent, um, Cortex will, will go back into the data lake, into its view, and it will show that actually Opera um, was where this, this, this truly started from. Um, when we analyze WinRAR, though, for example, we can see. Um, for, uh, as an example, how it was executed. And you can see that here WinRAR was executed against a file in a user's downloads folder, and that file is called Game of Thrones leaked last episode.zip. Having seen the last episode of Game of Thrones, I suspect this was probably not worth doing in the first place. But you can start to understand the context. A security analyst, the dots will be clicking together in his mind that, okay, this is a, a threat that has come from some user activity uh, maybe they've they've been fished in some way. They've been provided with this what looks like a file that's that's gen that's a genuine kind of script from an episode of a TV program. Um, the next thing that we can see is command.exe. So now we can see the execution of one of the files that existed within that zip file, and it's Game of Thrones leak last episode script .docx .bat. So interesting double file extension there. Of course, Windows in a lot of cases will literally throw away the .bat part and a user will be presented with what they think is a Windows, um, a Word document, not a batch script. Now, once that bat file occurred, we saw many activities starting to occur. We saw curl.exe, C-U-R-L, which is um, a, a command line um, script, uh, an application that allows you to download objects from the internet. You can see that that was run against cnn.com um, but actually the firewall you can see that the, the flag there that's come up identified this as command and control traffic so it's so the firewall has raised an alert at this point to say that when curl made that request 
it effectively is identified as command and control due to the nature of the request that was made. Um, we can also see PowerShell running at this point in time as well. And we have the ability to show the entire command line. You can see here actually PowerShell is being used to download a file from a, a bit.ly URL there. Um, and of course that file is our identified malware kernel.exe. And again, a traps alert appears at this point in time to say, here's a suspicious executable uh, classified as, you know, detected as malware. And of course, in a lot of, in many, in most circumstances, this would have been the end of the story because kernel.exe identified as malware, our traps endpoint would have blocked that malware, the threat would have gone no further. But of course, in a lot of circumstances, this, you know, the purpose of detection and response is to identify the threats that we didn't see. So in this circumstance, we're actually allowing kernel.exe to execute so that we can see what Cortex XDR is showing about what happens next. And you can see these behavioral indicators starting to occur, um, one of which identified as manipulation of Windows Defender config. It's effectively a net stop wind defender command that's being run by that malware. And also, we can also see another BIOC, um, process request the deletion of Windows shadow copy. So this is important because that's that's a, a typical strategy used by ransomware um, to prevent um, uh, Windows from uh, being able to uh, be, be reverted to an earlier restore point. Um, so that was a very quick kind of overview of Cortex, but hopefully it, it shows you sort of the, some of the information that you can get and how we can correlate that information. Okay, thank you, John. Um, audio seems to have gone on mine, but um, have you pressed mute? Amy, or? are you still there? Oh, yeah, still oh, here. Hey, Mike, hey. Yeah, I can hear you now. <laughs> I think we lost you just at the end. Um, oh, right. Sorry brilliant, that. that's thank you. That's okay. Um, I think we've got everything anyway. So um, just open up to questions now. So if you do have any questions at all, there is a questions panel just at the right hand side of your screen. If you type your questions in there, I'll read those out for John. I'll just see if any have come through. So one question here says, can Cortex XDR use logos from other security technologies or just Palo Alto? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so um, in the early stages of Cortex's development, we wanted to, to, to keep it on our technology so that we could kind of fine tune it. Um, so up until now, um, it, it, the network component um, should be a, next gen, a Palo next gen firewall. The endpoint component needs to be a traps endpoint. However, we have recently announced that um, we're going to be expanding to third party technologies as well. And the first one um, that's going to happen um, towards probably the end, end of the year uh, will be the integration with, um, with checkpoint firewalls as well. So you're not going to be just limited to, um, to Palo technologies. We, we understand that most customers don't necessarily only buy one brand as much as we'd like them to buy ours. Um, you're going to have a mixture of different technologies in your network. But we are looking to address that. Um, in the future. Brilliant, thank you. And another question here that says, how do you manage Prisma access security policies if you have existing firewalls? Oh, okay, so Prisma access can, um, will soon be able to be managed in two ways. And the use case that you talk about there is where you're using Prisma access in a hybrid mode. Um, and what that means is, yes, you're using the kind of service-based component that the firewall is a service essentially to secure remote offices um, but you might still have um, on-premise firewalls that you want to use like palo alto firewalls in your head office and data centers and the like and yes you can you you can you can have a solution essentially that provides consistent security across all of those devices with the same policies. It will be managed by um, what we call panorama which is our center centralized management console. Now if that's great for um, a scenario where you've got an on-premise component as well as Prisma Access, but where you only have Prisma Access, we have just announced that we, we're going to have a cloud 
management console, essentially a panorama equivalent, but one that is managed in the cloud directly. So you won't have to have a VM or a piece of hardware to do management. Um, it would all be done um, effectively in a, in a cloud-based management console. Hope that answers your question. That's great, thank you, John. So I think that's all the questions that we've got today. So thank you everyone for joining the webinar today. I hope you found it valuable. And also thank you, John, for presenting. Really appreciate that. Um, as mentioned at the beginning, our, uh, today we did record the webinar. So I'll send you all a link to the recording, hopefully this afternoon, if not tomorrow morning. Um, so thanks everyone and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you guys. Have a good one.